Well, welcome to week four in our series on the book of Job. We've been studying the book of Job, not just reading it, but studying it and learning from from it. And each week we've uh, looked at a very important aspect of the book of Job uh, that is crucial to understanding its real meaning and its real message. Uh, now I've kind of kind of given away what the real meaning and message of the book is in the in the subtitle of our series, the book of Job. Do we worship God or the goods that He gives us? Because that's what the whole book of Job is really about. The book of Job is actually not about Job. Uh, it's not about suffering. Uh, it is actually about God and His policies and about us, how we respond to God uh, when we suffer or when something happens to us. How do we think about or how do we reflect on God? But the centerpiece of the whole book is this uh, God is in the dock. It's what we talked about last time. That God and the way that He runs the world is, uh, is, is, is under scrutiny. And the question is, is does God run the universe right? The whole book of Job is a scenario that's laid out for us. And the question as we walk through the book of Job uh, is constantly at the forefront. Will Job turn his back on God and reject God because he's suffering? If he does, then he's only ever worshipped God because of the benefits. And uh, the challenger's uh, accusation is would be confirmed and God would lose the trial. But as you know, hopefully, uh, in the book of Job, that... Um, that God's policies are, uh, that God is defended and exonerated from these charges, and that Job is the hero, the star witness, that proves that God's policies are not leading people to only worship Him for the benefits that He gives us. So this is kind of where we started in our study, why study Job? Then we talked about uh, is the devil in the divine assembly, and I kind of explained to you how in the original language and in the Hebrew and so on, that the word Satan translated in our English Bibles, Hasatan, is a, is a challenger who is in the is in the divine assembly, and not necessarily uh, the evil devilish figure that we read about in the New Testament or the little, the slithering serpent that we read about in the Garden of Eden. But this is simply a challenger in God's presence, challenging God's way of doing the world and asking the big question of the whole book: Does Job fear God? For nothing. Which leads us to the, is God in the dock, which we talked about last time. And the answer to that question is absolutely God is in the dock, but, but also we are in the dock. Because how will we respond to God whenever we faced difficulties or troubles in our life? And that leads us today to today's lesson, which is, does Job have friends in low places? One of the things that, we ha that happens in the book of Job, of course, is that he suffers greatly and gravely. Uh, first, his, uh, his children... Uh, his his uh, his crop or his herds, his possessions are taken from him. His family, except for his wife, is taken from him. But he doesn't turn his back on God. Uh, and then there's a second round of suffering when uh, Job is 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 further punished, and this time it it comes to his own body, to his own self that goes through great suffering, and he's he's in agonizing pain. He's covered in sores from the head of his from his head to his feet, uh, and he's in writhing agony, he, and, and his friends come to see him. His wife says to him something like this, Job, why don't you just curse God and die? No one really knows if that is a comforting statement or if that is just an invitation to do what the challenger said he should do and would do, which is just turn your back on God because bad things happen to you, um, which would, of course, you know, again, it would, it would mean that God would lose would lose the trial. Uh, but but then Job's three friends are there. And there's a fourth friend that comes in later on. But the primary figures are these three friends that are, you know, you can kind of see depicted in the artwork we've been using. And these three friends at first come to Job and they are, uh, they don't say anything. <laughs> they just see him and all of his misery and sadness and and heartache, and they and they actually are kind of comforting to him, and they try to be comforting to him. They give him what, in seminary, we used to, they, they would call the ministry of presence. You know, just being with someone during a hard time and just being a presence with them through uh, their difficulty. But then 
something happens which becomes the, the dialogue of the entire book of Job from ch after chapter 3 all the way through almost the entire book, which is these three friends begin to say to Job, listen, Job, we know you're suffering, we know this is really hard for you, but why don't you just finally come around and admit it? The reason you're suffering is because you've sinned. Now, what they have in their mind is a belief uh, that we talked about last time. And I want to take a moment and review a little bit of that with you. We called it the retribution principle. And uh, it's, a, it's a term that's used um, by experts who study this part of, of the Bible and study this, this, this uh, whole idea, which was very prevalent in the ancient world. And it was a belief that, that good things happen to good people, that God would reward good behavior with blessing, and that bad things would happen to bad people, that God would punish them uh, for what they are going through. Uh, a simple way to dis define it is, the righteous will prosper and the wicked will suffer. But a more nuanced way to describe it is, if you see someone prospering, they must be righteous. And if you see someone suffering, they must be wicked. Now that is an inference that's drawn from that. And, and, and although this statement is generally true, actually, that generally it is true that righteous people will prosper. It's what the book of Proverbs teaches. And it's also generally true that the wicked will suffer. That is generally true. But what is not true is the inference that gets drawn from that, which is, hey, if someone's prospering, if they're rich, they must really be righteous. Well, we know that's not true, right? And if you see someone who is suffering, they must be wicked. That is what everyone in the book of Job seems to believe. They seem to just assume that this principle is, is true. And a big part of the book of Job is actually putting this principle also on trial to see if it's true. And I showed you this last time, this uh, triangle of tension of God's justice, the retribution principle, and Job's righteousness all in tension with each other. And I told you last time, if you just kind of walk through each one of these little corners, that uh, Job, uh, that, uh, that, that basically everyone in the book believes in this thing called the retribution principle. But it is especially being defended by the three friends. They come in and they say, Job, you've clearly done something wrong. They're, 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 you, you need to admit it. You need to just confess it. Uh, this, is, this is what's happened and this is why you are suffering. Um, they give him bad advice too, and I mentioned this last time. They, 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 they teach him to follow the, what we call the doctrine of appeasement. Just appease God. Just, just, you know what? You're suffering. You must have done something wrong. Just go tell God, look, whatever you want. Um, I've done something wrong and, and, and I'm just going to appease you. And I told you last time that that also would be a way for God to lose the trial. Because if Job just keeps trying to appease God, then you know what's true? He's only following God for the benefit. He's only following God for the blessing. If he's just going to try to keep doing these good things so that God will bless him, then that's the mindset of Job. The second uh, thing here is Job himself in the book. And throughout the book of Job, Job does something amazing. He defends himself. He says, you know what? I haven't done anything wrong. And do you know what? He hasn't done anything wrong to deserve this. The book of Job makes that really clear. And he defends himself. But you know what he attacks? Because he assumes this is true. He attacks the top of, of the triangle, which is he attacks the idea of God is just. He believes that the universe must work like this. He believes that he is righteous, but then he con concludes that God is just not just. And you know what he wants to do? Is he wants to take God to court. And he wants uh, to have someone to defend him and to say, you know what? Job is, is righteous and good and he's not done anything wrong and he doesn't deserve this. Well, you know what? That's actually true. God himself in the book of Job says Job is innocent and doesn't deserve any of this. And so the whole question of the book of Job is not a question of God's justice, but Job uh, attacks that notion uh, of God and he wants to face him in court. The third part of the triangle, you know, is the idea of God's justice. And this is where the fourth friend comes in named Elihu. 
Later on in the book of Job, Elihu comes in and he says to the three friends who are defending the retribution principle and saying Job must have done something wrong, that he's not righteous. Elihu comes in and says, you know what? He, he, actually, he actually is a just God. And the reason that uh, you don't understand this, Job, is because you've actually misunderstood what the retribution principle really is. And your sin is your self-righteousness, that you keep defending yourself. And so the, the, the story goes on like that. I'll just give you an example of it, okay? So here are the three friends, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar. And these are just little snippets from the book of Job, uh, where in the dialogue section of the book, uh, they come out and they say these things. And you'll see uh, their mindset and criticism of Job embedded uh, in these verses. So in Job 4.8 it says, As I have seen those who plow iniquity and sow trouble reap the same. Now Eliphaz is, is talking to Job. You know, he's supposedly a comforter, right? He's comforting him. But then he says, you know what, Job, to tell you the truth, what I have seen is this, that when something bad happens to somebody, they did something to cause that bad thing to happen to them. Those who plow iniquity sow trouble. In other words, if you've got trouble right now in your life, Job, it's your fault. You must have done something bad. And that's the retribution principle, the inference that gets drawn from it that assumes Job must be doing something bad. Bildad comes out and says, Job 8.4, if your children have sinned against him, against God, uh, he has delivered them into the power of their transgression. Job's children were killed, right? Well, Bildad says they deserved it. They did some sin. They did some bad thing. And that's actually not true. The book of Job tells us that they haven't sinned and done something bad. That's not the reason that they're going through what they're going through. But he maintains this idea that the only thing that makes sense for why they would suffer is because they must have sinned. And then Zophar comes out and says in Job 11:6, Know then that God exacts of you less than your guilt deserves. And what that's saying is you have gotten punishment from God because you deserve it. And you know what the truth is? You haven't even gotten all the punishment you deserve from God. You deserve even more. I mean, man, these are, you know, these are some really great friends. That's why I called today's study, uh, Does Job Have Friends in Low Places, right? Well, let's take this apart today. And I want to walk you through a little bit of the narrative of it as quickly as we can. And in the first moment when Job is it suffers his family is attacked his crops are his I keep saying that but his 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 sheep and his his his, his herds his possessions are taken from him um when, when, what he does at first when he finds out all this devastation happens to him is this this is job 120 and at this job got up and he tore his robe and he shaved his head that's a sign of grief and mourning and he fell to the ground and look what it says in worship. And he said, naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will depart. Of all the moments in the Bible that show the character of Job, this is one of the most astounding things that you see. Job is just simply saying in this moment of intense grief that he continues to worship God. He knows that he didn't bring anything in this world. He's not going to take anything out. He can't take anything out of it. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. And in all of this, Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. I mean, it's an absolute breathtaking response to suffering. And it shows us the way that we're supposed to think about God when we suffer, which is to say that we should continue to worship God, trust God, love God, follow God, no matter what. And then we see this in chapter 2, verse 9. His wife said to him, Are you still maintaining your integrity? Curse God and die. He replied, You're talking like a foolish woman. Shall we accept good from God and not trouble? In all this, Job did not sin in what he said. Now, if you pay attention to that, you can see, Shall we accept good from God and not trouble? That goes back to the heart of the book. Do I only worship God for the goods that he gives me, the benefits? Will I worship? Can I worship God when life comes apart, how will I think about God when I'm suffering? And Job refuses 
to give up on God in the midst of his hardship. This next slide's got a little bit more verses. I know they're a little bit smaller. You might take out your Bible. It's Job 2, 11 through 13. It says this. Now the three friends show up. And Job's three friends, Eliphaz the Timonite, Bildad the Shuhite, and Zophar the Namathite, heard about all the troubles that had come upon him. They set out from their homes and met together by agreement to go and sympathize with him and comfort him. When they saw him from a distance, they could hardly recognize him. And this is the moment when they first see Job after all that he's gone through and shaved his head and tore his robe and his grieving. And they began to weep aloud. I mean, just think about how comforting that was that they so grieved over their friend's pain. They tore their robes and they sprinkled dust on their heads. And then they sat on the ground with him for seven days and seven nights. And no one said a word to him because they saw how great his suffering was. Now, I want you to see the next response uh, to Job's suffering, which comes in the third chapter of the book of Job. So at first, Job's friends, his wife says to him, curse God and die, and we don't know if that means, you know, a comforting statement, like just go ahead and end your misery, and, or if, it, if, it's, if it's really meant in a negative way. But his friends seem like they're doing everything right. Does Job have friends in low places? At first, the answer to that question is, yeah. He's got some great friends. They show up, they weep with him, they care about him. They're so loving and supportive of him. And then let's see what happens next. In Job chapter 3, after this, Job opened his mouth. And he cursed, not God, but the day of his birth. And go and read Job 3. It's one of the saddest chapters in the Bible as he recounts the misery of his, of his, of his state. He, he despairs of life. He just, he just wishes that he could die. I mean, he is so overwhelmed with grief and sadness and pain. And you know what? Who wouldn't be in a situation like that? He even says this in verse 24, For sighing has become my daily food. My groans pour out like water. What I feared has come upon me. What I dreaded has happened to me. I have no peace, no quietness. I have no rest, but only turmoil. Think about what he's telling us about the inner workings of his heart, of his mind, of his feelings and his emotions. He's in turmoil right now. And he needs comfort. He needs support. He needs help. So does Job actually have friends in low places? Well, we're going to find out that at first he does, but at second he does not. And we see this in the dialogue that ensues when his comforters begin to give him their opinion about his situation. And I'm just going to kind of gra grab a few snippets of, of it so you can get a sense of this. In Job 5, 7 and 8, it says, Yet man is born, this is one of his friends, Yet man is born to trouble as surely as sparks fly upward. But if I were you, I would appeal to God, and I would lay my cause before him. The advice of one of his friends is this, Look, Job, the troubles that you're facing, the troubles that you're experiencing, uh, you know what, this stuff happens, probably your fault, and this is what I would do if I were you. I would appeal to God. I would, I would just appease God. I would, just, I would ask God to, to give me back my benefits kind of a thing, and I'd lay my cause before him. Here's another piece of advice, Job 8.20. Surely God does not reject the one who is blameless or strengthen the hands of evildoers. Surely God does not reject one who is blameless or strengthen the hands of evildoers. Uh, yeah, he does. <laughs> it's what the book of Job is actually about, isn't it? Job is blameless. He is following God. His family was following God. But God sent the storm of difficulty into Job's life. Surely God does not reject one who is blameless. The insinuation is what? Job, you're a sinner. The bad stuff that's happened to you, it's your fault. Retribution principle, right? Here's another example. Job 9, 32-34. One of his friends. Uh, God is not a mere mortal like me that I might answer him, that we might confront each other in court. Now, actually, this is Job speaking here. God is not a mere mortal like me that I might answer him, that we might confront each other in court. If only there were someone to mediate between us. You hear what Job is asking uh, to his friends? He's just, I just wish I could get a lawyer to defend me against God, defend my righteousness against God. If only there was someone to mediate between us, someone to bring us together, someone to remove God's rod from me 
so that his terror would frighten me no more. And this is one of the pleas throughout the book of Job, is Job asking for a mediator. You know, the famous line, I know my Redeemer lives, I'll stand with him on that day. I've told you, that doesn't mean Jesus. My Redeemer is a reference to Job pleading for a mediator to represent him before God and to defend his cause. In chapter 16, verse 1 and 2, it says, And then Job replied, I've heard many things like these, <laughs> he says to his friends after they're giving him all this advice. You are miserable comforters, all of you. You hear, you hear his response to them? They sit with him in his agony. They sit with him in his pain. They give him all of this. They, sit, they do everything right at first. And then their brain starts giving advice. And their brain can only think about God in terms of their bad theology, right? Bad theology. And their bad theology is bad things happen to bad people. Job, you are bad. Just admit it. Admit to God. Appease God. And everything will be fine. And Job says, no, you guys are wrong. I'm not a bad guy. I haven't done anything wrong. Uh, you know. And you're miserable comforters. <laughs> All of you. So what do we learn from, from this? Here's a little bit of application I think we can apply to our lives. It's a few, I think, meaningful things for us to think about. I think as we relate to other people and we think about ourselves, you and I should never assume that if we see somebody suffering, that that suffering is caused by their sin. Jesus has a story like this. Remember in the Gospels when there's this man born blind? And he comes to Jesus, and, and Jesus, of course, heals him. But he first of all asks the question, who sinned, this man or his, or his parents? I mean, how could he sin? He was born blind. You know, the assumption of the Pharisees in the, in the Gospels is the assumption of Job's friends in the book of Job. They assume someone sinned, and there has to be a reason why. Well, you know what? The Bible teaches us we should not assume that. Job has not sinned. His suffering is not, the cause, is not caused by his sin. Uh, the, the reason for Job's suffering is not even known to him. Here's the second thing. You and I should not rely on reason to care for feeling. What Job needs in this moment is what he got at the beginning. Friends that showed up, wept with him, cared about him, loved him, were attentive to him, were present with him. What he didn't need is what most of the book they do, which is, well, let me just, let me just te tell you something. Let me give you some advice, Job. Let me tell you, you, you you've got to know that you're doing something wrong. Uh, a, a term for this that's kind of used out there in the TED Talk world, uh, and you can go watch a TED Talk on this, is, is to say, don't be an advice monster. Don't be somebody who just shows up in people's lives when they're going through something and they and just give advice. Oh, you should do this. You should do this. You should do this. Just appease God. You must have done something wrong. Uh, assuming that there's some kind of sin, maybe some kind of secret sin, uh, attaching shame to them like, like, like is being done, uh, done here. Uh, all of this is, is happening. But you know what we've seen in the New Testament? Uh, Jesus suffered. He didn't sin. Uh, Paul talked about the thorn in his flesh. He said it was given by Satan, not by God. Uh, suffering sometimes happens in our lives that it's not our fault, and we should not blame ourselves or other people for that. We also shouldn't do what, what they do in this story. They, they just kind of preach at them. They just kind of preach at Job, and they just kind of say, this is your fault. You deserve this. You, you did something to, to get in this situation. Um, what we should do is, all these are don'ts, here's what we should do. We should listen. We should be good listeners. You know, in order to listen, you know, they say you got two ears and one mouth. We got to close our mouth and listen. We've got to practice what good listening is. When, when someone is going through something hard and difficult in their lives, like Job is in this story, and we ask this question, does Job have friends in good places? And the answer is, and, and, and does he have friends in bad places? The answer at first is yes, and then at second it's no. And the model for us should be the first and not the latter. We should not judge people assuming, presuming their sin. We should not come to them with our reason and ration while they're in the midst of pain and emotion. We should come with compassion and empathy and understanding and patience and we should listen to what it is that they have to say. Listening is such a powerful way 
to bring about healing in people's hearts and in people's lives. So I want to encourage you as we walk through this book of Job and the study of the book of Job to consider putting this, this into practice in your life. This is kind of where the book of Job goes from just the story of Job or the story of theology or the big questions of life into something that's real personal for us. You know, the, the book of Job is asking us this question, do we worship God or the goods that he gives us? It's also asking us this, the inverse of that question, which is, how do I feel about God when I suffer? But, but there's, a, there's, a, there's another part of this, which is how are we relating to people, our friends, when they are suffering? And are we approaching them from a place of understanding and of love and of listening and of care? And my encouragement to you is to take this, the, these principles and put them to practice in your life. I think it can transform the way that we help people when they're going through hard times so that we really can be friends with them in not just low places, as the song says, but in the hard places and in the hard times of life. We can be a source of comfort to them. All right, we're finishing this, uh, this fourth video uh, on the lesson of Job, and I look forward to seeing you next time as we can continue our study of the book of Job. See you then.